I am the Philosophical Bachelor and today I'm going to talk about what is gay and lesbian philosophy. The extended essay entitled What is Gay and Lesbian Philosophy published in 2008 and is a compilation of five short essays dealing with homosexuality and morality, moral issues on coming out of the closet and outing others, homosexuality and the law, the metaphysics of homosexuality, homosexuality and religion, specifically the major Western monotheistic religions, and whether scientists should study the biology of homosexuality. While they are separate essays by different authors, their ideas flow into one another, and the editor, Raja Halwani, has done a great job in sequencing them since it is good to first understand, for instance, the issues surrounding the metaphysics or nature of homosexuality whether it's socially constructed or is part of one's essence, before looking at the religious and scientific arguments for and against it. Though the last paper is not on the scientific findings itself, but whether scientists should study the phenomena of homosexuality in the first place. That is, it is metaphysical which questions the methods rather than the results themselves. Suitably, the paper is published in a journal named Meta Philosophy. The individual essays build on one another and are an easy read, though for the sake of the coherence of my video, I will mostly refer to the main authors and not the other authors they refer to for their research unless it is pertinent, as it might otherwise be a confusion of many names. Without further ado, let's look at the first essay, Homosexuality and Morality by Gary Yeager. According to Gary Yeager, philosophers working on the morality of homosexuality approach it in two ways. 1. To determine the moral permissibility of homosexual behaviour. Most use natural or teleological arguments. 2. To determine whether homosexual orientations provide the same opportunities for flourishing, altruism and virtue as heterosexual orientations do. Chapter 1. Naturalism On the natural functions for sex, Jaeger notes that both critics and defenders of homosexuality commit the naturalistic fallacy. The naturalistic fallacy is to make the mistake in reasoning that what is natural is what is good, or how things should be. For the critics, their claim would go something like this. Sex between people of the same sex is wrong because it is not natural. Laws against homosexuality in many countries depend on the argument of unnatural sex to prohibit homosexual sex. But what has nature got to do with what is morally the right thing to do? Even if we permit that homosexual sex is indeed unnatural, which we do not, how is whether or not it is natural relevant to morality? Jaeger argues that those who think that homosexuality is immoral and want to constrain how others behave have the burden of proof. That is, it is for them to make the case on why is homosexuality unnatural and why naturalism is even a valid argument since they want to restrict the freedom of others compared to those who think that homosexuality is morally neutral and are not trying to constrain other people's behaviour. Jaeger turns to John Corvino, a defender of homosexuality, who outlines five ways critics have portrayed homosexuality to be unnatural. 1. It is statistically abnormal. 2. It is not practiced by other animals. 3. It does not proceed from innate desire. 4. It is disgusting or repulsive. 5. It violates the principal purpose of sex and our sexual organs. Tackling the first point, it is statistically abnormal. What is not normal statistically is not morally relevant. Many things we do fall outside statistical norms and yet we consider them to be ethically neutral if not ethically valuable, writes Jaeger. My own example is how most people may not help a beggar on the street whose condition warrants help. Just because most people walk on by do not make that the right thing to do. In fact, the rare person that does help is the praiseworthy one. The second point, it is not practiced by other animals, is blatantly untrue. Swans, giraffes, gorillas and bait bugs are just a few of the 450 species of animals documented which exhibit homosexual behaviour. Besides, how is what other animals do relevant? Human beings exhibit cognitive functions of rationality not found in other animals, and yet many do not doubt the relation between our rationality and our moral behaviour. The third point, it does not proceed from innate desire, might be false. Significant scientific data suggests that homosexuality is innate, writes Jaeger, citing a slew of scientific papers. Once again, whether it is innate or otherwise is not morally relevant. 
Violent dispositions may be innate in some human beings, but that does not make it permissible. On the fourth point, it is disgusting or repulsive, is a subjective point of view. That is, it is an opinion and not a fact. Jaeger observes how cognitivists maintain that authoritative moral beliefs must represent true facts in the world and not be mere expressions of feeling or emotion. Those who believe that we need to rely on reasoning based on empirical facts say that how we feel on a subject is not sufficient for us to make a proper moral judgement on it. Even those who argue that negative reactions of disgust and repulsion are reflexes, something instinctive in us, that reflect the intrinsic moral disdain people feel towards homosexuality, shows that such reflexes are driven by feelings and emotions and not sound moral reasoning, which is not reflexive. However, even non-cognitivists who think that a person's moral beliefs can only ever be expressions of feelings or emotions admit that these beliefs have no authority over others, especially those who do not share the same feelings. Those who insist upon the authority of their own perspective cannot help but talk past their opponents and avoid real moral argument, writes Jaeger. On the faith point, it violates the principal purpose of sex and our sexual organs. This argument fails because it falls prey to the naturalistic fallacy. By appealing to scientific biological facts or teleological assertions, this argument avoids the pitfalls of subjective, emotional-based arguments. A common teleological claim is that sex is for reproduction and to have sex for any other purpose is immoral. However, it is debatable if the sexual organs are made for and only for reproduction. Most sexual acts, including most heterosexual ones, are not done for reproductive purposes. So this claim can also be targeted at non-homosexuals for their purported immorality. Besides, some people, such as those who are barren, are incapable of reproduction. Should they not have sex at all? Even if we accept that sex and the sexual organs have a specific purpose of reproduction, why is it morally wrong to use it for any other purpose? Jaeger responds with an example to show the absurdity of that line of reasoning. Is it morally wrong to use a fork to scratch one's back? The fork is ostensibly designed for eating with, but is it morally wrong to use it for some other purpose? In addition, even if we accept that everything has some final purpose, some teleology, it does not mean that homosexuality is hence defying that purpose. If the purpose of sex is for communication and expression, such purposes are met by both homosexuality and heterosexuality, argues Timothy Murphy. Part of such communication and expression is fulfillment and bringing people together. A possible counter is that only heterosexuality can properly bring people together because only heterosexuality expresses the otherness of a different gender. However, sex can communicate and express any number of differences and not just differences in gender. Communication is properly completed only through the mutual recognition of the other's desire, which can happen for both homosexuals and heterosexuals. Chapter 2. Flourishing Having torn down the arguments from what is natural, which has at least the semblance of objectivity if valid, Jaeger considers other arguments put forward to defend how one person's moral belief could govern another person's sex life. It can be argued from a social point of view that we need some norms to facilitate social cooperation. Even if we cannot objectively decide what is morally right for the individual, we may want to accept some norms and constraints for the sake of our society. Martha Nussbaum makes a distinction between norms of responsibility and norms of repression. Norms of responsibility serve the well-being of others or some other greater good. Norms of repression only seems valuable if what is being repressed is detrimental to others or society, summarizes Jaeger. According to Jaeger, a convincing case for how homosexuality threatens heterosexuals has never been made. While certain actual concrete health problems have affected homosexuals disproportionately, the cause of these health problems is not homosexuality per se, but the repression of homosexuality. Repression causes mental health issues like depression and restricts the dissemination of needed information on disease prevention, leading to physical health issues. Such homophobic norms are norms of repression, which asymmetrically constrain one portion of the population, according to Jaeger. It stigmatizes one group while creating a shame-free zone for the heteronormative. In other words, the norms of homophobia are created to reallocate to an unfortunate few the shame that it is an integral part of everyone's sexuality, writes Jaeger. 
In addition, norms of heterosexuality and homophobia prevent people from exploring their sexuality and in that way may lead them to not be able to develop their own authentic identities, causing them to lead unfulfilled lives. How can that be moral? Instead of repression, an openness to diverse types of relationships can be opportunities for homosexuals to be responsible to one's partners, intimates, and to community and to oneself. Jaeger concludes that those who argue for morality based on their own subjective feelings and opinions should then consider and respect other people's subjective feelings and opinions. Thank you. Please tell us what you think in the comments section below and if you wish to support The Philosophical Bachelor, you can do so at worldwideweb.patreon.com slash philosophicalbachelor.